very warm welcome to Janet Davey, Shadow Minister for Faiths. It's great to have you uh, here with us. Um, I'm going to um, ask a few questions and then um, we can open up the discussions to, to other people taking part in the call. Please do write your questions in the chat box. Um, we'll probably do that after about 25, 30 minutes, so, but I'll I'll remind everyone uh, when we get to that point. So um, once again, welcome, uh, Janet Davey. I'd like to start by asking you um, about your role. What, what is your role entail and, and what are your priorities um, uh, within it? Well, thank you very much, Christopher, and uh, really pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, very much delighted. Um, so, yes, so my role is, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm Janet Davey, the Shadow Minister for Faith. And I, I see my role really mainly in, in three parts, I, I would say. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, this uh, situation that we're in uh, nationally and globally, I very much see my responsibility of making sure that uh, faith uh, uh, and places of worship have a voice really and this is about making sure that uh, during this whole pandemic that faith groups voices are not the last to, to be heard but actually they're up in the forefront um, in terms of making sure that they uh, feel that they're being listened to and this is very much because of, of faith groups and their activity around what they're doing to, to help people and to support people during this time of crisis but also the the um, emotional and spiritual support that's also so given to people through the beliefs that they hold so dearly to them. Uh, another uh, area of my role that I feel uh, is, is, is paramount really, and that's around the uh, issues to do with internally within the Labour Party, around how the, the party uh, on, on a whole has been found to be uh, failing severely in terms of anti-Semitism, and that was that's been very clear to us due to the uh, EHRC uh, report that has came out regarding the failings and, and misgivings. So there's a, a real uh, a need to, to build back better in the party and to rid the party where people are discriminatory, where they're anti-Semitic, and, uh, and we need to, to put that right. I have a, a role that I'm playing in there to support the leadership in doing this and to making sure that absolutely does happen, absolutely. Um, and then I suppose my, the other area is about uh, faith groups in, in particular really, and places of worship, making sure that going forward that uh, uh, faith, uh, and people of faith feel that they are valued in our society, that they have a position where uh, they are listened to and that they are, are fully um, involved in, in policy areas. Uh, so going forward, I'm about raising the profile of places of worship, people of worship and faith leaders. Well, thank you very much for that. that that's uh, very helpful to get that. Um... The scope of what you're you're trying to do. Um, I do want to come on to the anti-Semitism question um, in a moment, but before I do that, I'd like to ask you about your own faith background. Are, are you a are you a person of faith? I am a person of faith. Yeah, very happy to be a person of faith uh, by choice. Uh, I I mean I I grew up in a, a quite a liberal Christian uh, home, but um, I decided to um, uh, commit myself to Christianity when I was about fifteen years old. Uh, so I've held various positions within the church, mainly around being a, a Sunday school leader and uh, and uh, being involved in that really, and uh, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. At one time, I was even a, a church warden during an interregnum period, which is one of the most difficult periods to, to be a church warden. Um, in terms of an affiliation, I... I, I, obviously, I see myself as a Christian, uh, but in saying that, I've attended a, a Baptist church, I've attended a Church of England church, I've attended a, 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 um, a when I say attended, I've been committed to these various denominations at one time or another, and uh, Ealing Church, and also Evangelical. So I have a very rounded experience of Christianity throughout my years of being a, a Christian, which I still am. 
If I could also add, though, that when I was a, a local councillor and I was a cabinet member for community safety, um, I was very, and I still am, very engaged with faith partnerships across the um, across the borough of Lewisham, and uh, and I've always had a keen interest in faith groups coming together, working together, and uh, appreciating one another, respecting each other, and I recognise the huge. Um, difference faith groups can make to certain areas and the way in which uh, people of faith are so giving uh, and really just want to improve communities and improve people's lives and I have a lot of um, admiration for that. Now you mentioned earlier about the uh, issue of anti-semitism within the Labour Party which is part of your your role in, in tackling and you said when you took over the role of shadow minister that that you wanted to rebuild relations between the Labour Party and the Jewish communities that have been let down. But what, in your assessment, is the root of the problem here? Um, I know it's I know it's a complex has has been a complex issue. Um, but what is what do you see as the root of the of of the problem? Why was so much anti-Semitism allowed to to come into the Labour Party? It's complex. Uh, it's a uh, that's a, a, a very complex um, question. There's probably no one specific um, answer to this, um, and I imagine there's lots of different thoughts around this. One would be that there are different prejudices within all uh, parts of our society and within all parties, and that it's parties and Labour Party's responsibility to stay on top of that, where they're they're. Uh, there are people that act in a way and behave in a way and are uh, racist, anti-Semitic, uh, then that, that people, we always as a party need to stay on top of that. But obviously there are issues within the, the governance and, and legal side of the, the party uh, that was very much highlighted by the um, report that was done. There was also um, a, a huge increase to people joining the Labour Party and uh, I think the, the processes and the background checks uh, need to make sure it needs to, it, there needs to be a, a, a something which ensures those background checks are done really. So you know who's coming in uh, of your, into your party. Uh, we're a party of, of equality, of fairness, of, of not being discriminatory. So to be uh, viewed as being as discriminating uh, against uh, Jewish people is the most horrendous thing that, or the most, or I'd say is the most horrendous thing that we could find out as a party that, that how we are behaving. Uh, so we need to do everything within our, 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 our power and authority to, to make sure that stops um, and to get rid of people that are behaving in this way and those that need training or need skills or need a, a greater level of understanding then we need to make sure people receive that so in terms of the um of of the roots um yeah, i i think it is is it, it would the, there's a varied answer to that i don't think there is any one particular answer or, um you know we all want to have um magic wands you know to be able to uh, to put things right and this is one of those things that definitely needs to be put right. And, and I'm committed to, to making sure uh, everything that I can do, that, that I do it to, to put this right within our party. Um, you know, I, it, 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 it's, a, it's an awful thing to happen to the Jewish community and it shouldn't be happening uh, within the Labour Party's um, uh, systems, within our meetings. It just shouldn't be happening at all. You, you mentioned that many people joined the party and, and that was obviously under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Um, do you think if, if Jeremy Corbyn wins his battle to have the whip reinstated, will that will that be a damaging thing, do you think, in, in winning trust back? So this, I mean, there's certain things I'm, I'm it's, uh, I'm not, uh, um, uh, it, I'm, I'm not allowed to comment on when it's things are going through a type of procedural matter. And that's really so that um, I, I'm not influencing something in any way. And also to ensure that I'm not given a perspective that isn't 
uh, the, where I haven't been given the uh, the uh, the okay, the sign off of to do that. Really, in terms of the the great expansion of the the Labour Party during the the period when uh, Jeremy uh, was the the leader of the party, um, there were obviously very mixed views about this. Um, and, and I need to be fair to say that um, before Jeremy became leader, there were there were cases where people were anti-Semitic. But obviously, while he was a leader, those cases increased. So something terribly went wrong there. And that's why we're in the situation we're in, where we need to make sure that we are dealing with this in a robust way. And in a way which is where we're working with um, our Jewish communities to so that we're building that trust back and I know this will take time it's not about words or just about words it's about actions as well and uh, I'm very confident that the action plan that we put together that we put together with our um, wider Jewish networks and Jewish community that we can get this right but this will take time and uh, and uh, we, we need to um, just do the best that we can really in, in every aspect. Okay, well, I'm sure there may be other questions about this about this topic, um, and uh, of course, people can write their questions in, in the chat box. But I'd like to come on to a slightly a different um, area, um, and that's on the question of of those who have be Christian beliefs within within the party. Of course, it was Harold Wilson who said the Labour Party owed more to Methodism than Marx. Um, yet it has been said that people with uh, strongly held Christian beliefs in the party uh, are not always welcome. Do you think there is some intolerance there? You know, Labour Party is um, a broad church, all right, but I don't necessarily think that as a party we've always be behaved in, in that way. I think that the voice of the, the Christian voice has, uh, uh, has probably uh, been, has gone a bit quiet within the, the Labour Party. And I, uh, I believe that this area of um, and anti-Semitism within the party and, and really needing to raise the profile of the Jewish community, I think it's really helping and help to raise the profile of other communities as well. But it's awful that out of such a, a, a horrid situation that, that um, this is happening, but we know that uh, sometimes it's out of these, these uh, uh, dark situations that there becomes the uh, increased light you know to improve things I do think that the um, Christian community would welcome a greater voice within uh, the Labour Party and I do think that um, the, uh, the profile of faiths is being raised within the Labour Party I know that Keir is committed to meeting with faith groups and is committed to and is meeting with faith groups and uh, I know that in my role, I value that relationship and building those relationships. And uh, I believe that as we do that, um, from the leadership, from the, the shadow bench and, and within the other members of parliament, that all of this will translate down into, um, uh, you know, uh, constituency meetings and to branch meetings as well. But I also know there are many members uh, MP members who are of faith, MPs, and there are many Labour members that are of faith, um, and Christian faith included. So I believe that um, Christianity still has a place within our party and is still having a place. And I, I also know on a, a local government level that, um, uh, that the, the party values uh, uh, Christian leaders, values uh, the contribution that uh, uh, the Christian faith makes um, on the ground to society and the relationships that they have within uh, with Christian leaders and within with other faith leaders as well. Um, as you will be aware, the government has uh, launched a review of its relations with uh, faith groups. What, what do you make of that review? What's your take on that? So the government has, having, uh, has been having these um, roundtable uh, discussions um, during the uh, coronavirus period. Um, but although they've been having these discussions, uh, I believe that the faith groups feel like they are the last, they are the afterthought. And the, the roundtable discussions haven't necessarily been much of an interaction regarding uh, 
uh, uh, sharing ideas, but more in the government saying what's going to happen and how things are, are going to progress or work. And that then uh, demonstrates an ina inadequacy of, of the, the government in terms of the, those uh, connections and how well they could have used those roundtable conversations. So, for example, during the, the first lockdown, there was the, the conversation that places of worship will be open for individual prayer. Now, that only works for a small sector of places of worship, uh, mainly for Catholic religion, the Church of England religion, where their buildings uh, enable that and where that works within those faith groups. But that doesn't work for all faith groups. Uh, there are many other uh, uh, faith leaders and places of worship, um, individual prayer wouldn't be, wouldn't be um, appropriate. People can do individual prayer within their own homes, you know, and uh, especially for, obviously for the Jewish community, the Muslim community as well, it's more about uh, coming together to pray together. So in terms of the government putting out what is and isn't acceptable, it needs to make sure that this reaches a, a, a vast array of, of faith groups and faith leaders. Otherwise, what it's saying it bears no consequence to um, other faith groups. And that shows a level of ignorance within the, uh, the government and, and lack of awareness. Uh, there's also the, the sense that some faith groups aren't able to have their own uh, buildings and they rent buildings. So it's mixed messages which are given to um, um, worshippers, you know, and, and congregation members when the government makes these uh, announcements. The other issue as well is that obviously going into this second uh, lockdown, um, faith groups were not were not consulted, and, uh, and you know you, you would I'm sure you're aware of where uh, many letters from faith leaders were written to the government saying that you've ignored us in this second lockdown, and you haven't been given us the voice that we need. Um, and the explanations haven't been clear about why the government has made certain decisions. So this uh, consultation that the government's doing is a response because uh, of the criticism that uh, has come their way um, from significant faith leaders. Uh, and they're responding to do uh, a survey, uh, a consultation, and rightly so, they should do that. Do you think the government has a... Has a a problem with religion is, is, it, is it ignorant do you think that's a, that's a, a, a broad brush isn't it <laughs> um has a problem with religion uh i'm sure that uh what i would say is that there was there's ways in which the government could consult with religious organizations and They've missed the plot. If you've got roundtable meetings and discussions, we'll use them to the, the best uh, the, the best way in which you can. There was also an issue right at the beginning where um, the roundtable meetings were not uh, very diverse. Uh, and then the government got criticised for that. Then all of a sudden, the roundtable meetings uh, and the representatives on those meetings became uh, were from a more diverse background. What I would say is the, the government needs to value uh, faith groups and listen to faith groups. They also need to carry out um, their own internal investigations around issues that, um, that are, are prevalent within their own party. You, you mean around Islamophobia? Yes, you? yes, I do, yes. You think they haven't done enough on that? No, they haven't. No, no. I think that there's a, you know, their, you know, their leader, the Prime Minister Johnson, has made lots of um, uh, um, inflammatory, prejudiced, racist remarks, and um, there is a, and, a, and then there's also the the hostile environment of the government, um, you know, the wind rush. So there are there are serious elements within the the Tory party where they, they also need to address issues and uh, in the same way we are addressing our issues uh, and they need to address theirs. What would Labour's um, approach be with faith groups were you in government? I mean we are in a very uncertain political uh, phase. Could it easily be that um, things could shift and you might find yourselves in government? Um, what, what would your approach be with, with faith groups? Well, thank you for that, 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 that positive suggestion. I, I uh, completely agree with you and uh, um, 
and I'd be delighted for that, that situation uh, to, to happen. Um, for me, uh, right now, um, I'm engaging with lots of different uh, faith groups and I'm having the conversations with them and I'm having the roundtable discussions with them. I'm still reaching out to other faith groups as well. And all you need to do is look at my Twitter and go, go through my Twitter feed to, to see uh, how active uh, uh, I, I, I am being. Uh, for me, it's about making sure that faith groups um, have that, that voice around the table uh, in, in the first instance. Um, faith, there are, there are many people in our country that have a faith and practice faith. And uh, faith often doesn't get the, um, the respect it deserves. And uh, there are many uh, faith groups at the moment that are really uh, having to prop up local government. And that's happened since uh, 2010, the, the cuts that local authorities have experienced and are continuing to experience. And there are many uh, faith groups that uh, run um, community groups to support people that have that feel isolated or older people or people that have special needs or disabilities. There's lots of the, the untold work that faith groups are doing around providing food and meeting dietary needs for not this, just their congregation, but for the wider community. So for me, it's about valuing those faith groups listening to faith groups and seeing where where they feel government needs to uh, intervene to ensure that they are supported to carry out the vital work and support networks that they are doing and some of that could could be you know the greater um, uh, um, relationships with the local authority I've got a meeting coming up actually with the local government association just to really look again at how um, that local authority relationship with faith groups. I'm also aware that Stephen Timms, who's the chair of the all party parliamentary group, I think it's for, for um, I'm not sure, I think it's for religion or, or, or so on, but he's recently done a, um, Goldsmith University have recently done a, a study. And that study really highlights the high percentage of, of faith groups interactions with local government and highlights also local governments uh, reaching out uh, to faith groups as well. So for me, it'd be looking at very much that whole relationship on strengthening that relationship um, but on a, on a wider scale, um, I know that many uh, uh, black uh, Christian church leaders um, have got very strong views around um, education for black children and making sure there is a, a curriculum that reflects a, a significant history, which is helpful for children's self-esteem and identity. Um, I also know that for, um, when I've spoken to um, the, uh, the you know uh, Catholics um, they're very uh, concerned about um, care homes and uh, the, the treatment of the elderly in those homes so these different uh, areas in which faith really does reach out into the community and it's about recognizing those conversations and making sure that the support is there for them it's also for me as I've mentioned earlier about um, raising the profile of faith within the Labour Party as well, and making sure that we're on top of um, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, uh, anti-Black racism, anything which, um, which stains the, the character of people's lives, which disadvantages people, discriminates against people, it's making sure that doesn't happen within the Labour Party. And coming into government, which we will as a party, we need to make sure that our house is in order first, and I think that if we can demonstrate that we can do that, which we can and we will, which we will, then um, I think that really prepares us and gets us ready for coming into government because the country will recognise the changes that we're making, the commitments we're sticking to, and, um, and hopefully they will see the, the unifying force that we will uh, become and, uh, and, and trust us in for government in the future, near future. Okay, well... I'd like to ask people to um, write their questions if they've got any questions. Um, certainly uh, anyone who's got anything they want to ask, please please do uh, write that in the chat box. Um, I want to ask you, do you, do you agree with um, Stephen Timms' report when it says there should be a faith commissioner? That's something that 
or, or an office for faith engagement? Because that's, that's something I think that's being looked at closely. Would you agree yeah, with that? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I would agree. I think we underestimate how many people are of a faith background and how many people practice faith. I think there was a huge underestimation within our country. And I think if we had a, a, um, some type of, of faith, I'm open to the idea and I'm happy to explore the idea. And at the moment, I find that very favourable. Yeah. How can religious literacy be improved? And do you feel RE as a subject is dying and needs to be renamed? Excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, I, I recently met with, um, I'm trying to think of the name, it was, it was the National Association of Teachers for Religious Education. Uh, it was a really interesting conversation. I really appreciated it. It was very much about uh, religious education being a statutory subject, which it is, but it's often not given the um, hours it, it deserves in many schools. But actually, children um, from diverse backgrounds seem to do achieve uh, higher grades in religious education, which means it's very meaningful to many children, mainly from diverse backgrounds. But I think there is a sense that it, 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 um, it hasn't been and isn't being given the recognition it deserves. So I, I do agree with you with what you're saying there. Um, but actually, if we look at religious education, it's very much about respecting others' uh, uh, religious beliefs, uh, being aware of those religious beliefs, being aware of people's different cultures and difference, and again, valuing and respecting that. And if uh, I believe we had more of that type of education and religious education in our schools, then actually that calls for a more cohesive society because people and children from a young age would be more aware of different religions, different practices, more accepting, um, and it will reduce the, the fear and dispel sometimes the, um, you know, what people make up themselves and their own interpretations of this. It comes from an educative point of view, which I think children and young people really need. So um, I have it on my agenda, actually, to keep raising the issue. I have raised it in Parliament already about religious education and the significance of religious education and preserving this and giving it the statutory hours it deserves. But it remains on my agenda as something that I want to press forward with uh, and keep uh, pushing forward with, because I think this will also reduce um, some of the harm that young people experience through being um, groomed on the internet and it could will reduce some of the, the grooming that, that takes place for uh, potential terrorist uh, um, behaviour. Another uh, question here, uh, Colin Bloom, the uh, government's faith uh, advisor, uh, it says it's time for a religion, religion and belief training across the civil service. Is that something you would uh, support? Yeah, I, I wouldn't not support that. I'd like to know what he means by that training. And uh, I'd like more information about how who would do that training, how it would be rolled out. I think uh, it's uh, I, 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 I think it'd be a good idea to do that. I think um, uh, uh, people aren't as aware of different religions and practices. And if there is, if it's been identified that this is an area of need within the, the civil service, then I, I think maybe with that, that would be a very good thing. Okay. Civil um, service needs to be on top of their game, you know, and, they're, and either they're working very hard in, in really difficult times. Okay, um, Ruth Peacock asks, uh, do you think the Conservatives have stolen the march on Labour by emphasising the importance of faith in society? And is there still a reluctance in Labour uh, to not do God in the famous uh, words of Alastair Campbell? Well, I am doing God. And there are many MPs uh, across, Labour MPs across Parliament that are also uh, doing God because, I, I, because I, I've met with them. I also know many uh, uh, members that are also of, of a different, different faith. I think within the party, it's just about raising uh, the profile um, of, of different faiths and keeping to do that. And that is happening within the faith, uh, within Labour at the moment. And I'm hearing very, very positive things. So no, I don't think the Tories could ever st steal uh, uh, God within the Labour Party. And also we have, um, we have many uh, affiliated um, 
religious groups to the Labour Party that are, that are a loud voice within the Labour Party as well, have been for, for many years and are, are doing so at the now. And that uh, Catholics for Labour, um, uh, whether that's uh, Christians on the left um, and also um, Sikhs for Labour and, and so on. There are many, um, and the Jewish Labour movement, there are many um, affiliations and uh, the, uh, and I, the Labour Muslim Network as well. So there, there are many, and I probably haven't mentioned them all, but I, I really hope that's not going to be held against me. <laughs> uh, but uh, but we do we do have them, and I'm very proud to to have those affiliations as well. Now, Amanda Hancock asks a very important question here. Uh, many in the Labour Party have traditionally supported Palestinians. Do you think this is this has allowed anti-Semitism to grow within the party? Of course. This is this has often been cited as one of the, the key uh, issues in the anti-Semitism problems, um, but perhaps you could respond to that 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 question. Yeah, sure, Sean, no problem. So um, it, it's a it's a it's a very good uh, question, and it's um, it's a conversation I've been having with many, many of my uh, Jewish links and, and, and connections as well, just to make sure that I'm really balanced at, uh, in, uh, in, my, um, in my awareness of the situations. And also I've had some conversations with people that are, are, are for Palestine. My perspective is that people can be both for um, Israeli Jewish people and can be for Palestinian people. And, uh, and this to me all points towards obviously uh, having a two-state solution in, uh, for, for Israel and for Palestinian uh, people. I think that um, when people are recognizing the, the difficulties that Palestinian people are experiencing in Israel, they also need to be aware of the difficulties that um, Israeli people have experienced as well and some of the, the his, history towards uh, um, uh, Israel. And it, some, sometimes what um, uh, people could do, which I, I think is totally wrong, is they make generalizations and they stigmatize people. And uh, I say this from being a, a, a black woman who's uh, experienced uh, racial discrimination, that when uh, you know people hear of a, a uh, awful situation that maybe someone or a community or even a government has done. You should never use a, a blanket approach to for that to mean that everybody is the same. That's discrimination. That's wrong. Uh, I think it is absolutely fine for people to be able to say where they feel that there's a human rights issue or where they feel that children aren't being treated in a certain way. Um, but they need to, people need to know by both sides of the story. It's like, um, it's like a divorce. I'm not saying this is a divorce, but it's like a divorce, you know. Uh, one partner will say something, another partner will say something. You need to know both sides of the story or not get involved at all. <laughs> so, um, and that would be uh, my my perspective on this, really. But um, I think, yeah, where, you know, uh, in terms of uh, people taking a, a stance for Palestinian uh, people, it doesn't mean they need to be against um, Israeli Jewish people. And that's what I would say to them, you know, yes, be a voice if you want to speak out for that community, but it doesn't mean that you have to hate, and it doesn't mean you need to act on that hate as well, because that's anti-Semitism. Okay, um, a question from Dr. Lois Lee, who asks about uh, if you could talk about whether you engage non-religious in your work, those without a faith identity are crucial to addressing many of the issues that you raise, perception and recognition of faith groups, viewpoints from the Labour Party, etc. But are frameworks built around faith providing the scope or opportunities for engagement across religious and non-religious traditions that we need? Could improvements be made? So I um, I, I think for my experience is that um, people of faith haven't necessarily had as much profile um, within um, uh, within of of late within the, the, the party and, and within, within politics. Uh, I mean, there, there has always been uh, religious engagement. There has always, and with certain faiths, and that's positive. But there, there is always engagement with people that are, are not of faith. 
And I suppose that's the first point I want to make. The second point is, yes, I am in, involved with people of no faith. I am involved with the humanists and I have been engaging with them and I have been working with them and making sure that they experience uh, e equality that they so rightly deserve as well. And that's been around uh, humanist marriages. Uh, and I've been able to um, support other MPs in asking certain questions around that. And, I, and, I, and I've had a meeting with the humanists, so I think one or two, and I've got another one coming up. So I do actually engage with people of no faith as well. And um, I'm really here to, um, if people want to reach out to me as well, where they feel maybe that I, I haven't uh, responded or listened or not, not necessarily listened, but haven't met with them, then I, I'd be happy to do that. But yes, I am also speaking to the, to the humanists as well. Uh, the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, <laughs> Catherine Peppenster, who's asked about um, some of the, the clash between people of faith and secular culture, for example, um, where registrars have been sacked for refusing to hold same-sex wedding cer ceremonies. Is that the appropriate response or should there be special arrangements for the believer in those circumstances? Um, so this is this is to do with your, a, a, your person's own conscience really around this. And it's, it's similar to probably to um, a vote of conscience in the parliament as well. Um, my, own, my own view around this would be um, that I'd, I'd, I'd like to have, have some more information on it, obviously. How, I'd like to have those conversations with people. But I, I think, and it's, it's almost um, similar as, as well to whether someone wishes to partake in uh, the, the medical process of an abortion. I think they, their nurses uh, have a choice. So I think it should, um, I mean, this is, this is highly um, complex and controversial. Um, and uh, what, what I think needs to be, there needs to be something in place that respects uh, people's uh, conscience and, and views of, of faith, as well as that protects people's rights that want to uh, um, ensure that they can also um, be treated equally within their own rights as well. Okay. I, I think that that needs to that needs to happen. But just just picking up on that question that Catherine's asked, and let's take for example the question of, of, of trans rights I mean there are religious people who feel quite strongly about gender that it's not something that can be just changed um, and then there's also we have cancel culture that someone expresses a view say against trans rights they get cancelled out um, and that we've seen some of that in the Labour Party where, where, do, you, where do you sit on, on that on that tension? So this hasn't, uh, if I'm honest, this hasn't necessarily been brought to my attention yet in terms of, of in terms of faith and these type, these deeply um, uh, uh, moving and controversial issues. That hasn't been brought to my attention yet. The first one, um, and I, th this is, um, you see, people's faith often um, uh, in often affects how they uh, feel about certain things. Um, and people of faith could have um, two opposing views on this. One could be very much for this issue, another one could be against it. And I think the main issue here is that uh, people do not act on uh, discriminating people because of their, their, their own faith view. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they should then be ostracized or be um, not respected because they hold that faith view. Okay, um, moving to a different subject now. Um, what about bishops in the House of Lords? Should there be a, a, a broader representation of faiths um, in the House of Lords, for example, in light of dwindling um, Church of England attendant, attendance figures? That's from Ruth Peacock. Yes, thank you, Ruth. I don't know if the figures are dwindling. Are they dwindling? The figures I've got is that the Church of England is growing. And that has, uh, well, during the virus, I think all faith groups have been <laughs> dwindling in one aspect or another. Uh, 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 and all those uh, Zoom is the, the new way forward at this moment in time. Uh, people have been able to are trying to manage as, as best they can, really. Um, but in terms of the Church of England figures, I, I think you'd need to look at that again before the, the coronavirus lockdown. Maybe 
in certain um, areas outside of London and, and bigger cities, the, the numbers may be, may be dwindling in the more, more rural areas, but I, I think it's, it's growing. Listen, we are a, a diverse, multicultural, multi-faith country, and that needs to be reflected in av every aspect of our politics and in the House of Lords as well. Okay, so faith leaders um, across the board, there's a possibility of getting into the House of Lords under a, under a future Labour government? I, I, I don't see why not. Uh, I think that's something to consider, something to, to think about and, and to, to work towards. But I'm not giving you a definite, a, a definite uh, yes, because that is, is not in my gift. But I do not, I would not like to see that as a barrier. Yeah, we've just got lots for us of as a party. Mm. We've got lots of faith leaders and other Catholic. Yeah. That they're, they're ambitious. To, they, they want to know if it's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it, I, it, I, that's something I will take forward without okay. a doubt. Um, uh, a question from uh, uh, Andrew Brown. Um, I don't know if you saw this heartbreaking report from Burnley um, with two priests who are helping families who who would really fallen through the the safety net and. Um, were, were in a, in a terrible, terrible state. Um, are you worried that the state is is coming to rely on faith based charities to do the jobs that the state should be doing? You know, food banks are good, but should they be normalised? I did see this video. It was uh, very uh, moving. I, I I think I was a bit tearful over watching this video as well. It was um, they're doing great work in Burnley and. They're very passionate people that are putting their, their heart into this, their heart and soul into this, and they're making a significant difference in people's lives by um, giving uh, food provision. Uh, but they're really going uh, uh, over and above, really, with the way in which they're managing that situation. Um, I don't know any food bank that... Um, all food banks do great works. So they all help people in need and provide for them. But... They, they were doing so many different varying, you know, varying ways of making sure they get provision to people. But they were also providing them with a, a real um, level of emotional support. And um, I really, um, uh, that was really moving. Um, I think the government's already announced that they think food banks are a good thing. That I think they, they announced that even before the virus. They felt that was the community helping the community. They did not consider that as um, as uh, the the um, outcome of universal credit. They, their conscience seems to I don't know how their conscience can be clear uh, that people have to wait five weeks before they get universal credit benefit. People in jobs don't have to wait uh, five weeks before they get their pay, but yet people that uh, find themselves in a situation where they need financial support they have to wait five weeks for that so that means people are in debt even before they get the universal credit money when the government had said that people could get um could uh, get um loans um meaning that they can get some money earlier on but that money still comes out of their universal credit isn't any extra money that's coming their way so um people need dignity people want to look after themselves they want to make their own choices you know, I don't think anybody grows up thinking, oh, yeah, I want to be on universal credit. That's, you know, but people find themselves in that situation. Uh, the government has made it that the poor are very poor. And uh, I mean, I started up a, a food bank when I was a local councillor. I started it up with local community leaders and, and faith groups in my in my area of my ward at that time. Uh, before the virus, it was having about 40 people coming to visit, uh, but individuals, it would be about 70. In terms of the food, it supported the number of people it supported with food, it was about 72 people. Um, the week before last, it was 185 people lining up to come and get food. Uh, yesterday, it was 145 people. Times that by four, three or four, then actually that's how many people the, the food is able to, to support. This isn't right. This isn't healthy for people's, uh, for people emotionally. This isn't uh, healthy for um, parents to be able to provide for their families in a in a dignified way. And uh, you, you know, we know what it's like ourselves when we're sitting down to have a meal. We we want choice. There's certain foods we like, certain foods we don't like, certain foods we digest better than others. Things we need to stay away from. 
Um, this cannot be, should not be part of our society. This is not something the government should be proud about or should be pleased that it's happening. It should be something that the government should be seeking to prevent. Uh, any food bank leader that I have spoken to have said the greatest success will be when this food bank is no longer needed. And I completely agree with that. More questions coming in. Um, going back to, I think, the anti-Semitism question, Sharon Booth asks if some self-awareness training could be carried out for members of the party. One of the problems seemed to be the inability to admit that they, were pre they had prejudices. Um, what would you what I mean do you think that should happen some kind of self-awareness yes. training yes I, I think I think she's she's absolutely right there um I mean I I I, I, I don't think I said it but I'm very sorry for the anti-semitism within the party and very sorry that uh for the experiences that Jewish people have experienced and and how that people are still feeling and uh, the, I absolutely agree there does need to be self-awareness training uh, people need to be able to reflect on what they say, how they say it, and how people behave towards each other and why they behave that way. Um, it needs to be something, I believe, that starts, um, it, I, to be honest, I think it needs to just be at every level within the Labour Party, every level. Um, usually I say that train needs to start from the top down, um, but I actually think with this, we need to, this needs to be dealt with on, on all levels. Uh, and uh, um, and in, in, in every part of our party. And, the, and when people sign up to become Labour members, it needs to be clear in terms of uh, codes of, of conduct and behaviour. And this is the action plan um, uh, will be, uh, we'll be addressing this. Uh, of course, at the heart of Christian faith and, and many other faiths, but at the heart of the Christian faith is, is reconciliation. Do you think, given the the, um, the internal fighting that we've seen uh, in the Labour Party, would you, would you recommend some form of reconciliation um, to to handle some of these 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 issues? So, um, you know, I, as you know, I've, I've said I'm a personal faith myself here now. So, um, re you're right. So re reconciliation, redemption. Uh, being restored, all of these are, are good faith principles that, that we have. Um, but some people don't want to change. Some people um, believe that their view is the right view and uh, they're not open to this. And that's where it's, uh, it's to recognize who are those people that are truly, and I'll speak in spiritual terms, truly repentant of this uh, of, of this behavior and this circumstance and recognize they're wrong and and who are those that actually will say the right things to get by but actually you know uh, deep down they, they they don't believe and who are those people that actually um have got no intention of changing you know who are those people and it's about uh being able to draw the line i think that there are some people no you can't reach they don't want to be reached uh, you're just going to waste your time and energy on them. Uh, why tolerate them and take their views on board? I don't think so. But uh, those that can, yes, of course, of, absolutely, of course, have the training, do the reconciliation. You know, we want uh, we want more people for us than people that are against us. And I also think that the more people learn about each other and know about each other, it reduces fear um, and uh, and helps more people to be more neighbourly. And this is why I, I'm very much uh, believing in community work, uh, communities getting to know each other, communities speaking and discussing things with each other, and especially with young people as well. Young people often don't feel as if they speak to enough adults or enough adults uh, respect them. We need to always be close to young people and it helps to reduce any fears that young people have and the fears that older people have of young people. And I'm just, demonstrating that type of same type of relationship yes reconciliation yes working together as much as we can but those that uh that we can't work with don't work with them okay now um but we're drawing uh to a close now i think we've got time for a few few more questions um Sorcha connell asks uh from from your perspective how can the media uh improve when it comes to covering uh, religion or how can it improve faith journalism what, what would your 
you beyond that? You really are giving me a lot to think about <laughs> this <laughs> this lunchtime. Um, faith journalism. Uh, how can we improve faith journalism? I suppose more uh, balanced, uh, well, more stories about uh, what faith groups are doing and the significance uh, faith brings to our society. Uh, very much around what I've already spoken for. If we had more stories, I think that'd be really helpful. Like those um, leaders in, in Burnley, if we had stories about that, I think people want to hear that. You know, the media obviously give, usually gives us the sensational stories, the distress, the sadness. Um, and within faith communities, obviously there will be some of that. But I think people also want to hear about the good that's happening and the, the changing of lives that is happening I think if we had more positive news, I think that'd be helpful. Um, and uh, I, I generally uh, think that, you know, people within faith communities want to make a, a difference and want to improve lives. It's not an area that I've, uh, I, uh, I've given much thought to until now, but I will, um, I will, consider, I will consider where else um, journalism would be helpful. I know a lot of faith groups themselves have um, internal magazines and ways to communicate. I think there may also be something here where faith groups need to also um, take their guard down about the media as well and actually go to the media with stories because the media will um, print what they know but often they need they rely on information coming to them. So I think there's probably some work that needs to be done two ways here, both with um, uh, faith organisations and, and leaders uh, and with the media as well. Well, look, on that note, I'd like to um, conclude the session and, and, and thank you very much, um, Janet Davey, for your time um, this afternoon. It's been a really fascinating um, discussion and I've certainly learnt a lot and it's been really great to hear about your work and your perspective. So. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you very much again for inviting me and, and thank you for giving me an opportunity just to, to, um, to express my views and what's happening with, uh, within the Labour Party and within the Shadow Brief. Thank you very much.